Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased to have with me Dr. Nisha McSweeney to tell us all about her fascinating new book just out in 2023 from Penguin titled The West, A New History of an Old Idea. This is a great book, a radical new account of how the idea of the West, whatever that term means, and in fact, it means rather a lot and has done a lot of work in the past few hundred years. And that's exactly what this book is investigating. What is this idea? What role has it played in shaping a particular understanding of history? And maybe what do we want to do about it? Um, So a book that engages a lot of important and fascinating ideas and does so in a really interesting way. So Nisha, I'm so pleased to have you on the podcast to tell us all about it. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Before we dive into the book, I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a bit about yourself and explain how you came to write this. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I am a professor of classical archaeology at the University of Vienna. And for the best part of the last 20 years or so, I've been doing research into the ancient Greek world and especially how the ancient Greeks saw their own origins and foundation myths um, and uh, historiography. And so actually it was quite a small step in a sense, a huge step, but also a small step um, to take those same questions and to start applying those questions to the world around me rather than the ancient Greek world. Um, and that was partly because um, I was realizing more and more how our modern West, or well, the modern West that, that um, you and I live in, Miranda, um, it looks back to the ancient Greek world as its um, point of origin. Um, and so I, I realized as, as a, a classicist, loosely um, defined that I was kind of part of this origin myth or or complicit in kind of promoting this origin myth. And so I wanted to to kind of pick at it a bit and understand it. And um, this book is the result of, of doing that. Thank you for introducing us a bit to the background. I often find that interesting books come from something that we kind of want to poke at often something that bugs us and that doesn't quite make sense. We're like, no, 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 I'm just going to go do a bit of light reading and that will sort things out. And then suddenly you've written a whole book. Um, So I'm not hugely surprised to hear that that sounds like what you've done. Um, So given that we've raised this idea of the origin myth um, and now we want to kind of unpack it, first, of course, we have to know what it is. So how do you define the term, quote, the West with a capital W? Capital West, and sometimes a capital T as well. Um, mm. The West, I think, stands as a handy shorthand for um, the the developed world uh, today, which is culturally as well as economically um, linked into a kind of a, a kind of network of different related uh, civilizational traits, if we want to call them that. So that is um, uh, political. Setups um, based or including ideas of representative democracy, um, notionally secular um, political systems, um, often an idea of um, an economic setup based around uh, market capitalism, and often social setups based around um, um, individualism. And so, you know, it, in a real sense, that's that's often. You know the Americas and Europe and uh, the broader Anglosphere um, tends to be included in the West. But actually, what I was trying to get at in the book as well is that this is what we think the West is now, but the definitions of what the West was has been been pretty slippery over time, and it has changed over the centuries. And that is one of the things I I wanted to capture in this book. So. In this idea of a myth, I mean, already the idea of kind of, well, it means this. Well, it means that now. It used to mean other things. Hmm. Well, that kind of already gives us an idea that it is a myth, if part of the myth is that it's always been this way. Um, And one of the things that you sort of start off with in the book is that a lot of the kind of pillars of this myth, including that one, that it's always been like this, are just not accurate 
are just factually not correct and that we can kind of poke at them individually and go, well, let's knock this one down, let's knock that one down. But despite the fact that we've got a whole bunch of knowledge and have for a while that many of these pillars aren't really as true as people think, the myth seems to be pretty strong, seems to be going along quite well despite not having a lot of facts behind it. Why is it so persuasive, pervasive and persuasive? Yeah, I mean, this is this is really the, the core of it. And none of these kind of the myths, which we kind of the myths we, myths we might want to bust, I mean, none of that is in a sense new if we're busting these myths. We know we, you know, for quite a few people, we, we know that there isn't a straight line of civilizational genealogy between ancient Greeks and the modern West. You know, we we know that there are um, cultural influences from all across uh, Europe and Africa and Asia, which have come together. We know that, right? So none, none, none of that kind of factual stuff is completely radically new in and of itself all these little bits right as you said these little things that you might want to pick at and yet when you shove them all together somehow this giant edifice of western history or western civilization or the span of of western civilization somehow despite the fact that every every pillar is built on being completely shaky or non-existent or built out of sand somehow the edifice is still standing, right? And, you know, it's, it's just there in popular culture and in popular books and often in the prospectuses, campus prospectuses from, you know, from universities, common study classics, it's the origins of Western civilization. I mean, we, we just see it everywhere. Um, and the reason why, oh, sorry, the reason why it's still there is because it's so um, bound up with the uh, political ideas of what the West is and what it should be and ideas of the place of the West in the world. And for many of us, we have a sense of what the place of the West is in the world and what the place of the West should be in the world. And that is supported by this grand edifice, this historiography of, of what Western civilization is. And if we let go of one, we have to kind of let go of the other. And, um, you know, we're, we're not comfortable letting go of the one. So therefore, we haven't been able to bring ourselves to let go of the other as well. And so I think that's it. It's the, it's the coupling of historiography and political utility. Um, and, and we're finding it hard to, to, to break that. Well, I think we're going to get into how those things go together um, in specifics now that we have that lovely foundation of exactly what we're talking about. Um, I'd love to draw on your expertise in the classics, in the ancient world, a little bit. If you could tell us where the initial ingredients of this myth of the West, what are they and where do these come from? So I think they they, they, they really begin with... Um, the, the, the ingredients being that the, um, the West is born in the ancient Greek world um, and that, that it is something which is unique and separate uh, culturally, pristine, if you will, um, and distinct from the rest of the world, that there is this uh, polar dif difference between the West and the rest. Um, and we still hear this uh, today in political rhetoric and it's kind of baked into... Um, all kinds of um, international structures as well. Um, and the the elements of that sense of civilizational opposition, we can find them time and time again in different centuries, in different ways, but they are conceded differently. Um, and so, I mean, the, the book starts in the, the classical Greek world, so obviously my own area of expertise, and it starts with the, the, the polarization or the, the division of the world into Greeks and barbarians and how this is um, conceptualized and how it is constructed through discourse, um, specifically in the context of um, fifth century Athens, which is, as, as we often, many of us would, will know, but we kind of forget, often conveniently forget, is, is, is itself an imperial power and which uses this discourse of othering this discourse of civilizational clash um, in order to justify its own imperialist activities. So we've got, from the very beginning, we've got this yoking together of um, historiography and political utility. Um, and and, and the, the idea of us and them and the clash of civilizations is, 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 is you know, it's 
it's so it's this the political utility of it is is uh, absolutely baked into that idea of civilizational opposition. Um, but then, as we move through history, the, the civilizations being opposed change very radically over time. There is not that constant that we might expect of East versus West or Europe versus Asia. Those are not constants at all. And um, for me, some of the, the surprising thing in doing the research for this book was, was finding just how different some of the, the polarizations were, that the configurations were quite different to what I might have expected. Okay, well, I'm glad I'm not the only one that was surprised because I must admit um, this idea of us and them, I sort of was expecting to find that in this book. I was not, however, expecting for so many early histories of this concept to talk about not necessarily Europe versus Asia or anything like that, to talk about Troy. They really seemed to like be interested in Troy and especially pretending that they were descended from Troy, whoever they might be in a particular history. Um, that's obviously not something we've kept. So why were they so bothered really about this idea of descent about Troy? And when, why, when did we lose that? Yeah, I mean, so this is it. I, I, this is one of the ways that I came into this. Um, I was working on mythical genealogies coming out of Troy, precisely this uh, topic. I thought it was just so surprising to find that as you moved into the um, high medieval period, that there are just a proliferation of noble houses and uh, groups of people across um, most of Europe, which claim descent. Um, from Troy, and these really complicated mythological genealogies are constructed to demonstrate how um, how you know the Franks, or how the Teutons, or how the early British, or how even the Norse gods are descended from the royal house of Troy. Um, and you have these wonderful competing genealogies um, across different parts of Europe as well, which are produced to argue that this set of descendants of Troy is less elevated than the other set of descendants from Troy, and the Padawans are less elevated um, than the Venetians, or, or vice versa. And um, it's this kind of historical one, historiographical one upmanship. Um, yeah, so it, th this was one of the most interesting things uh, for me when I was starting out with the book as well. And um, I think a lot of it boils down to Rome and the claim from uh, on the part of Rome and especially the, the Julio-Claudian dynasty at Rome um, of descent from Troy, or descent from uh, fleeing Trojans at the end of the Trojan War. And so it meant that almost any group, as we move into the, the medieval period, almost any group which wants to claim legitimacy based on um, relationships with Rome therefore also claims um, a, a relationship with Troy as well. And then it stands outwards to even groups which don't claim um, a relationship um, to Rome, uh, that Troy is so important that they, they claim that genealogy going back to Troy, even though they don't claim um, a Roman genealogy. And, it, you know, you just find it in the most surprising places. I mean, obviously in, in Italy, um, in Central Europe, but also um as well in Central Asia as well. And um, when we move into the early modern period, the Ottoman Empire, um, there are these kind of very perplexing texts, 15th and, and 16th century texts, which describe the um, the Turkey as Tukri, that they are, they are, they're, they're, they're Tukrians, they're Trojans. Um, and there was this kind of a thread of diplomacy as well, um, which links the Ottomans back to a, a Trojan past. And of course, the Ottomans claim um, their universal world empire as they, they claim to be the heirs of the, um, the, the Roman Caesars as well. So in fact, it's one of the titles that they claim for themselves. So it, the, 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 the popularity of this idea of Trojan ancestry is, is just crazy. It's huge, uh, much more than what we'd expect nowadays and it stems from this idea of um, the transfer of authority the transfer of power through time and um, it's it all kind of falls apart at, um, at the, it, as you move into the early 17th century really um, I think it's, it's been challenged uh, in the 16th century it's kind of beginning to fade already in the 16th century as we've got a rise of interest 
in ancient Greece. Um, you've obviously you know, had the Renaissance and we've had the kind of the revival of um, popularity of Greek literature and the rediscovery and reintroduction of uh, Greek uh, texts. But what comes with that at the expense of that is that um, instead of seeing the Trojans as the good guys in the Trojan War, we now see the Greeks as the good guys in the, in the Trojan War. And um, there's kind of this moment, the end of the 16th century, the beginning of the 17th, where Europe changes its allegiance or it changes where it thinks it comes from it's no longer the the biological descendant of troy but it's the the, the cultural descendant of greece instead and um that that switch that moment of reimagining european um history um i think is a, is a crucial one in making it in, in kind of crystallizing western history then the idea of the west really comes into focus at that point i think Thank you for explaining that. Um, I, I'm glad again. I'm not the only one who was surprised by this really intense thing on Troy. Um, and then kind of understanding, wait, if this was such a thing for so many people, where did it go? Because as you talk about in the book, there are other things that were created quite a long time ago in terms of the myth of the West that we do still have. Um, and then also pieces that were created later that we maybe don't admit were created later or were a bit fuzzy on the kind of when that came into being. Um, and one of them, of course, is this idea of the Greco-Roman world, right? Greece dash Rome, as if it's one concept. When in your previous answer, you just sort of suggested this idea of switching from Rome to Greece, right? That they were at one point seen as very different. And of course, anyone who knows any Roman history is like, hmm, yeah, Rome's relationship with Greece was... Uh, interesting tricky you know not exactly the same thing um and yet we have this idea now of a greek dash roman world as if it is much more together um than it was seen to be at the time and it seemed to be for a while afterwards so in almost the opposite of the previous question where i was like wait where did this troy thing come from and where did it go where did this greco roman thing come from <laughs> yeah it's, it comes from exactly this 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 kind of moment. You've had a bunch of historical um, factors coming together over the course of the 15th century, which has led to an increased knowledge or awareness or interest in the Greek world or the ancient Greek world. Um, and then, at, 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 you know, towards the end of the 16th century, that has, that kind of matures into this idea of, uh, cultural heritage and, and uh, cultural tradition, and it's it's the switch from 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 the elite from the Trojan allegiance to the Greek allegiance, which um which which kind of puts the Greek and Roman world into the the, the amalgam of Greco Roman, and that's when it it really comes comes together, and and it's, that's still disputed for uh, you know a good couple of centuries afterwards, and. We have, you know, especially in the German Enlightenment tradition, this really strong Orientalist scholar tradition, um, which would which would look to see kind of biblical scholarship and Near Eastern scholarship and yoke that with Romans or scholarship in the Roman world and kind of jump over Greece, um, and that for a long time is is a rival of the kind of the Greco Roman matrix, um, and then. You know, over time, um, by the middle of the it's the middle of the 18th century, I think you, you could pretty much squarely put it in the middle of the 18th century, um, with the rise, especially of um, you know major figures like um, Johann Johannes Winckelmann, who we think of as the founder of classical archaeology, um, that it becomes written in stone. But that's it. Somehow, the Greco-Roman matrix wins out over the uh, Romano biblical matrix or the Romano Near Eastern matrix. Um, but they, they, they're, they're really, you know, it's neck and neck for a while. Um, and, um, and, but, and, and it's, it's that point in the middle of the, uh, middle of the 18th century when um, classics, I suppose, as we think of it as a discipline, is, is born. One of the things you talk about in the book is, as we've sort of been discussing, the idea that there's a lot of different pieces that comprise the myth and they're sort of useful at different points in different time. And that kind of tells us why we've lost Troy but gained the Greco-Roman world, right? They're, they serve different uses and that changes. Um, but you talk about that a lot of these pieces that we still have today all kind of end up being in place or ready to be put into place, I suppose. Um, at the height of the Renaissance, right? That's kind of the time period that we're talking about. Um, 
what are some of these pieces, including, you know, a few we've not mentioned yet, and why was sort of this the time that they're all kind of coming up together? Yeah, so there's the the Greco-Roman matrix is one, absolutely. Then there's this idea of um, conjoin, uh, a, 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 the vision of um, a Christi- Christendom as a, as a single unified space. Um, and that kind of comes together around the same time um, for quite different reasons. Uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of rhetoric that gets quite heavily promoted by the Habsburgs, um, especially in the face of uh, confessional disputes across Europe and the kind of different types of Protestants popping up in different places and different, uh, d- different, different kind of varieties of Christianity and inheritors um, as, as were defined. Um, but the, the rhetoric of a cohesive Christendom um, being focused on Europe that's another important piece of the puzzle, and that is something which is it's is it's it's a promoted almost aggressively as an ideology um, by the Habsburgs in their specifically in their kind of face off against the Ottoman Empire, and you've got a, a number of kind of quite high profile um, engagements between the Habsburg Empire and the Ottoman Empire, including um, you know the siege of Malta. Um, it's not directly the Habsburgs, but it's Habsburg sponsored. Forces. You've got the Battle of Lepanto. Uh, you've got the Siege of Vienna, which comes up soon. And in all of these face face-offs, um, the rhetoric is employed of civilizational um, civilizational conflict and civilizational clash with Christianity on the one side and Islam on the other. Now, of course, you know we all know that the idea of a united Christendom papers over <laughs> in a million and one conventional divides. But it was very much in, especially Habsburg interests, to to play that all down and to play up that rhetoric of uh, combined Christianity and, and to feed it into um, this kind of growing ideological construct of Greco-Roman origins, united Christianity, Christendom, um, and, and put it all together. So that's another key piece of the puzzle. Um, another a kind of a third key piece of the puzzle is ideas about knowledge um, and ideas about science and how we we, we approach knowledge and uh, in different ways and so that's kind of more um, enlightenment developments or developments that we link to the enlightenment now in a way this undercuts um, questions of Christianity um, but it also uh, kind of combines with them to say that this is also something that is uniquely Western and that characterizes the West. Um, and what it does is that it kind of nicely ties together the idea of Greco-Roman traditions with the idea of uh, Christian traditions in a line of knowledge, that knowledge can get passed down. Um, and, and and so that becomes crucial as well. Um, and then the fourth element, which kind of crystallizes things and, and puts it puts things into to place together, is the the European expansion expansion and exploration initially and then moving into kind of full-scale imperialism and then it's through that that we have the 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 vision of of all these things the west are being also layered up with an extra kind of on this palimpsest an extra layer of meaning which is 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 a racial meaning um and it's to do with who gets to be western and it is, it's essentially, it's, it's white people, but only a certain type of white person as well that can claim the right kind of Christianity, that can claim a Greco-Roman cultural or civilizational heritage. And then it becomes employed to justify um, inequalities and exploitation and imperialism um, and enslavement um, in the century or so that follows. So I'd like to talk about some of those nastier uses of this myth um, if we move across the ocean from Europe over to the United States, um, because one of the areas that you talk about this being used for things like racism, slavery, imperialism, um, was with the American founders, the people who founded the United States. And you describe that they faced an ideological quandary which is a fascinating phrase, um, and that one of the ways that they tried to solve this, they tried to adapt to this, is by taking this concept of Western civilization we've been talking about and fusing it with racial hierarchy. 
So can you tell us about this ideological quandary and how they tried to solve it? Yeah, absolutely. So it's one of the things which gets picked up by commentators at the time, that you have this revolutionary movement, which is, it claims to be anti-imperialism. So it is um, the American colonists wanting to escape from the shackles of British imperialism. And yet, at the same time, they're pretty okay with extending their own uh, imperial practices um, over the indigenous peoples of the Americas, and they're pretty okay with colonialism going on in other parts of the world as well. They just don't want to be subjects of it themselves. Um, and at the same time as well, you have this, this revolutionary movement talking a lot about liberty and talking about freedom and that being a cornerstone. But while they, while they do that, at the same time, they are perfectly okay with um, taking away the liberty of other people, enslaving other people, and continuing enslavement um, as well. And so there was this kind of ideological canker at the heart of the revolution. The the, the, the two key principles that they um, that they, they, they claim and they they celebrate are limited. It's only for them, and it's not for everyone else. And um, you know, this is absolutely picked up. Um, by commentators of the time, um, and it, you know, very famously, um, Tom Paine kind of argues about it, and you know, the question of American slavery um, as related to uh, American independence is, is quite widely discussed. But um, as you say, Miranda, this the idea of Western civilization and an elevated heritage kind of gets around that because you can make the argument then, then well, yes. It, liberty is important and freedom from imperialism is important, but for those people who are worthy of it. And the people who are worthy of it are the heirs of Western civilization. Um, and um, who are the heirs of Western civilization? They are uh, white, European-derived populations. Um, and, and that's how it, it can be justified, and, and it's often justified in quite an oblique way. Now, it kind of comes into it kind of hits a, a bump in the road or it becomes di- difficult when you have non-white or non-European-derived uh, populations, people who seem to also be the heirs of Western civilization or the heirs of the classical world. And you, you, know, you do get these um, fantastic figures. Phyllis Wheatley is, is the one that I write about in the book, who are, they, they master Greek and Latin, they are... Um, classical scholars in their own right and they think that this is going to give them the keys to social acceptance as it were or, or allow them to, to to be on the inside but but they won't be allowed on the inside phyllis wheatley is an enslaved african-american um and she will never quite belong it doesn't matter how erudite she is it doesn't matter how well she studies her greek um she she, she will never be an heir of western civilization which i think is really interesting and you can see the contrast between phyllis wheatley and another character which i talk about in an earlier chapter um a woman called ninjingo angola who is a, a a west african queen who does get um treated as if she's an heir of western civilization um because she's able to master the right civilizational markers and crucially because she converts to Christianity. So it's, it, they, their lives are only about a generation apart, but between Njinga and Phyllis, um, you know, there's one African woman who gets to be an heir of Western civilization. And a generation later, there's an African-American woman who does not get to be an heir of Western civilization. And that's, that's because the goalposts have changed and um, the racial element of it has become so firmly entrenched you can't look past it anymore. As those two examples um, illustrate, right, you very helpfully look at this concept not just in one place or time, but really how it's used in a lot of different ways. And that helps us understand kind of my initial question of why is it stuck around for so long when it doesn't actually uh, work with the facts? So I was wondering with that understanding of how it functioned, for example, with the American um, founding and the context of the creation of the United States and taking of territory and enslavement, um, if you could tell us a bit about how this concept was used sort of in beyond that, um, beyond that particular time and place, 
as an ideology for external subjugation, but also for internal populations as well, even if we're not talking just about the context of US slavery. Yes, actually, the question of how this story is used in internal subjugation is almost more interesting than in external subjugation. Um, there are any number of examples of how the idea of an elevated Western historical um, c civilizational heritage were used um, to to justify uh, Western imperial domination. I mean, a very well uh, discussed and researched example of this is in uh, the the British um, rule of India and the kinds of uh, classicizing and historicizing language that's used there and the lines of comparison drawn, especially between uh, the Roman Empire and the British Empire in its um, occupation of of India, and that was that's from both sides. That is often um, from the British side and from British um, uh, Brit British officials using the language of the Roman Empire, but also from Indian intellectuals as well, uh, using the language of the, the Roman Empire to argue against imperialism. So it works in both sides there. But then at the same time, we also have um, this idea of Western civilization and the elevated Western heritage being used internally um, as well. Um, and we, we, we see it within Britain, and we see it um, within the United States, especially um, used as a reason for it uses the reason for why uh, people who are exploited populations internally should be happy with their lot. Essentially, that they should be they should feel lucky or feel grateful that they are part of um, Western civilization, and therefore are necessarily superior to those people who are not part of Western civilization. And so it doesn't matter if you are at um, a low rung in society um, working, in, uh, uh, working in a mill or working in a factory under terrible conditions. Um, that shouldn't matter because you can still think of yourself as being superior to somebody halfway around the world who does not share in the same uh, glorious heritage that you get to share in. So it, it, it is used internally as well as externally. But then at the same time, again, it's always complex. Um, that can also be subverted as well. And, and we look in the 19th century, we're seeing more and more examples of truly popular reworkings, especially of classical stories to kind of subvert and reclaim um, the classics for the working classes um, and, and in an anti-elite manner as well. So it's it's it does work on, on both those both of those levels, both the internal and the external. And it works on those levels um not just in the past but very much in the present. And that idea of reclaiming ideas and which group gets to claim what. Um, and of course, why we're even talking about this in the first place, right? The myth of the West um remains very much a current topic. Um, and one of the ways that you engage with this in the book is in chapter 14. You directly compare um, what happened in January 2021 with the storming of the US Capitol and what happened in Hong Kong's parliament in July 2019. Why do you make this comparison? What does it tell us? Well, on the face of it, these are two very similar events. We have uh, groups of disaffected people who are deeply, deeply unhappy with the way the political um, administration of their of their country or of their territory is, is going. They think that they are being deprived of their political rights and their political future, their vision of the future is being taken from them um, unfairly. Um, and so they, they, they set out to protest and they, they it, it turns violent to different degrees and they end up occupying the main legislative building in both cases. Um, so on the face of it, these these look like very similar events. But then if you look at the reasons underlying these two events, they could not be more different. So in the the occupation of the, um, the leg co-building, as it's called, in Hong Kong was um, done by pro-democracy uh, pro protesters 
who were protesting against the removal of uh, what their democratic rights and freedoms and against the encroachment of Beijing um, into Hong Kong politics. Um, in contrast, the storming of the US Capitol building um, was done by uh, it was done by pro-Trump protesters who wanted to overturn um, the results of a democratic vote. They wanted less democracy, whereas the protesters in Hong Kong wanted more democracy. Um, and so th it's a very interesting reversal, this moment where something that we think of now as being absolutely fundamental in the modern West, and that is the, the principle of democracy, that that is no longer seen as necessarily um, vital to everyone within the West, or it, it's not held in quite the same uh, regard by everybody within the West. Um, and so the question kind of does beg to be asked, how far is it absolutely um, a characteristic or a feature of the West or Western populations in particular? Um, is it something which is just Western? Is it, uh, is it, will it continue to be a characteristic feature of the West in the future? Um, and I think it, it depends who you ask, I suppose. Well, I'm going to ask you, um, what should the West, what should a concept of Western identity, um, what what could a new version look like? It, we're at the moment, we've got two very contrasting visions of what the West should be in the coming century. And there is a vision which is focused around uh, tolerance and liberalism, uh, social liberalism, um, and uh, diversity and inclusivity. And there is a vision of the West which is focused around uh, non-toleration and uh, purity um, and what's viewed as tradition. Now, in my view, that latter perspective um, actually gets the idea of tradition wrong. It, it, it precisely holds to a vision of tradition and continuity which is which is incorrect and you know that's precisely what this book is all about that, that you know the things which many of the illiberal um westerners would claim to be cornerstones of western identity or uh enduring features of western identity are not in fact enduring features of western identity um and they're much more recent than these people might think so i would hope to see um, a new version of western identity which let it appear to let go of um, some of the old myths it tells itself um, and is willing to see things as much more fluid and is willing to embrace a much more diverse set of people um, than perhaps some others might, might want to embrace. Fair enough. Um, now, this always feels like a mildly unfair question, but especially when the book is just out and it is quite substantial with the number of ideas and the amount of research that you had to engage with. Um, but I'm going to ask anyway, as my final question, now that this book is available for people to pick up and read, is there anything you might be working on next that you'd like us to know about, whether or not it's a book, whether or not it's on the same topic? Well, at the, at the moment, I'm deeply involved in the my research project, which is very kind of fine, the opposite end of the scale. It's um, back into kind of micro history where I'm looking at um, migration and mobility around the Mediterranean in the first millennium BCE. Um, and in, in a way, what I'm, what I'm trying to do there is, is absolutely the opposite um, of this. Instead of taking macro narratives and looking at individual lives, I'm taking lots and lots of micro narratives about individual migrations and, and specific movements of very small groups of people and building up. So I'm looking kind of from the small up rather than from the big down. Um, um, and I'm, I'm trying to see the overall patterns of, of human flows and human mobility that we have um, during this period as pieced together from lots of individual stories. So I'm um, looking at things from the opposite perspective as, as from this book. Well, that sounds quite fascinating. Um, so when that becomes a book, obviously, we'll have you back and you can tell us all about it. Um, but also a fascinating challenge, I think, for a lot of us to think about methodologically going from kind of switching the perspective, as you said. Um, I think that might also give people some ideas for their own work about how to think about different projects and move between them. Um, so thank you kind of for explaining that piece of it as well. That's intriguing. 
Um, but I should probably let you actually, you know, get back to that work. So I will finish up just by reminding listeners that the book we've been talking about is titled The West, A New History of an Old Idea. It's just been released if you want to get your hands on it. Nisha, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me.